welcome to show studio sorry for the delay in going live my fault um here now so uh, we're going to be talking about the london shows um rounding up the i want to say like the men's or autumn winter 17 season but it's not really the autumn winter 17 season anymore because everything is sort of changing in terms of what's shown often you're seeing different seasons shown together some things that aren't even branded as a season some things that seem to appear for one season then disappear it's all very confusing basically we see a bunch of stuff all at the same time which is lovely and um, weird time for the london shows obviously because of the fact that so many designers are now showing men's and women's together there's this bit of a sort of like a, a gaping hole left in the london schedule where sort of burberry used to be and it used to really dominate on the london men's schedule in a way it's a good thing because it's put more of a spotlight on brands that perhaps would get overshadowed in the coverage that burberry would sort of take up um, but it has led to sort of I think rumours and rumblings about what the future of the London menswear shows will be and in, in general what the future of menswear shows will be and whether it makes more sense for, for men and women to show together. Anyway, that's me addressing the bigger themes of the season but before we dive into individual designers and highs and lows I'll let my fabulous set of panellists, all very dapper, um, introduce themselves starting with you Graham. So I'm Graham Moran, I am Head of Fashion and Features Content at Draper's. I'm Rob Noble and I'm senior menswear editor at style.com. And Lee Stockard's flatmate. And Lee Stockard's <laughs> <laughs> Your biggest claim to fame. I'm Simon Childers <laughs> and I'm men's style director at matchesfashion.com. Hi everyone. Sorry, Rob's Hello. like, I hate you. <laughs> <You're so embarrassing. laughs> um, so, can we? I'm interested to get all of your opinions on what I was just saying about about sort of the, the future of the men's shows, I guess, and particularly London collections, because it's kind of the baby of the menswear shows in some way. There's so much hype around it when it begun. Sort of, it was only a few years ago. I think it's really easy to forget. And now, obviously, there's everyone's kind of pedaled back and is like, actually, do we need menswear shows or should they go back to that form where they're kind of tagged in and tied in with the women's wear? Um, it's interesting to get sort of a retail perspective on this as well, because I imagine that you're buying teams like for them, it's more than just like sitting and watching a men's show and a women's wear show together. The fact that those schedules could change so considerably would be quite of an overhaul. What, what's your what's your take on it, um, and what's the take of what are the rumblings at Matches Fashion? Um, well, I think we're all really um, into London collections, and we always have been from the beginning because it's really important for the designers to have the platform to show um, their collections and. I personally am not a fan of the men's, women's combined thing. Um, I think it works in certain cases, like with Gucci, because it's such a thing, and with like Prada, because she's been doing that for quite a long time. But I, I found in London it was quite distracting. Yeah. And I found subsequently in other cities, actually, throughout the month, mm. I just, I either zone out completely from what the women's wear is, or yeah. it feels quite jarring against what the men's wear is. It's just, I don't know, it's very strange. But um, no, I mean, I think we'd all be very sad if there was no more London collections. Saying that, it could probably have a trim. Mm. It's interesting, because you kind of mentioned two distinct things there. There's, there are those shows where it feels like the, women, the women's wear, or it's kind of in vice versa at the women's wear shows, the men's wear is kind of shoehorned in, where it's a men's show, but it's got some, it's, it's pre, you know, that they'll just whack on in there. And then there are the other shows that are, you know, designed and produced and created as a men's and women's show. So Prada are actually a really interesting one, because Prada do the, the former, so they whack in some pre into the men's collections, but then they do a men's show and a women's show. But Prada, as you say, I think that's a really smart point. It always kind of, some people grumble that the women's wear overshadows the men's wear because it's often more sort of spectacular. But I think Prada really gets it right. Gucci do the latter where it's a men's and women's show together. Everyone else seems to do something a little bit in between where it's mm. kind of all, and is that part of the problem that we haven't just worked it out yet, the best way of doing it? I think it's about what a lot of people are saying about the whole like when to show, what to show, when, where to show it is, for a lot of people, it's what's right for your brand. So Sibling, mm. for example, they've got rid of their women's show and show main women's drawing men's. Mm. And the reason they say, one of the reasons behind that is because the sales books are open earlier, mm. it's you know more helpful with production and that, that sort of thing. And I think if that's right for them, then that's you know the best thing for their business as mm. a brand. But at the same time, it can be confusing when you're like, what is this? What are we seeing? Yeah. When you go from one show that's spring to one show that's autumn to one show that's seasonless to... Mm. So, but I think, I think it's kind of teething problems at the moment. No one really yeah. knows what they're doing or how to, you know, how to badge it 
like when we're putting content together, it's you know what are these the autumn shows now or yeah, are totally. they the September shows and the January yeah. shows? It's and then you've got you know it's even more. It was interesting right after the men's shows. Obviously, the couture started. And then you've also got ready to wear now sort of pushed into the, so Vetmon kind of kicked it off, but now Proenza are going to be doing that as well, where people are kind of sneaking their ready to wear into the couture. You're like, what? You just have no idea what's being shown. What's your take on it all, Rob? I think what stood out this season in terms of the men's and women's balance is you could tell when the design didn't really have a vision for their men's wear. So there was some, I think the reason why it works at places like Prada is that the men's and the women's are equally considered and kind of equal. Uh, attention is paid to them by that brand but there are a lot of shows actually in London where y you really did feel like women's was diluting the men's and that actually do you just want to be a women's wear brand in which yes. case just go and do that and if and uh, but if you want to be a men's wear brand then show men's wear and show something that's believable as men's wear whereas if you're just showing a load of quite exciting women's wear and then a few kind of boring jumpers and blazers for men then why, why, why are you doing are you it and actually this was a really strong menswear season, I thought, but the brands that did it really well were the ones who really articulated a fashion direction for men that wasn't yeah. just kind of stuff. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Like, I was, I think I've mentioned this on another panel, so I'm sorry to bore our viewers, but like, I was speaking to Simon's hero, Drew Spen, noted about this, and he, like you, because you're always in tune, is um, against the idea of men's and women's being shown together. And he said it's because he thinks that men's wear deserves better. And he was like, if you show them together, he was like, the men's wear is always going to be sort of, you know, a, <coughs> an accompaniment to the women's wear. And he was like, I feel like men's wear design deserves more than that. You know, it should be pushed forward. And he was like, the w it's always going to be about the women's wear press. You know, that they're going to get the better seats. It's always going to be about the girls. And he's like, who's going to win? It's Gigi Hadid, <laughs> which I thought was kind of funny. But I get, I get that point that often when the women's wear is in there, the men's wear, it doesn't feel like it's enough of a sort of di design direction has been put in place. Who did get it right this season, beyond brands that showed men's and women's together? Who made a really strong design proposition at the London shows? It felt like there was a few real standouts and I actually thought it was the best London we've had in ages and I thought the lack of a Burberry or a McQueen or a Tom Ford or whoever actually really helped some of these designers get the spotlight they deserved so I thought Martine really stepped up to the plate, Martine Rose, I thought that was the best, probably the best show of the whole season mm. in any city. Mm -hmm. I thought Cottweiler was really strong, um, I thought Liam Hodges was really strong, um, Craig's always brilliant. There were a few that kind of Kind of set the pace for the, for the season, and then I it, feel like they stepped up as well. Yeah, yes. and I felt like Milan was very flat this season, and it, and when you look back over the last month, you know it's a kind of blur of stuff. But there's a the kind of bits that really stand out in my head, and nearly all from London. Actually. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, why? Let's focus specifically on this Martine show. Because I mean, this show was so brilliant because it reminded me of what the whole point of London is from <coughs> years gone by. Um, which is that it was a show that had a venue that was part of the story of the brand. Yeah. And Cause I think tell the viewers where it was. Was it Seven Sisters Market? And it was like late on Sunday night and off schedule. Off schedule. And it was the tube strike. So if you were, if you got there, you had to really want to get there. Yeah. Which yeah. was a, a good mark of a show. Yeah. You know, when yeah. so many shows are like, please come to our presentation. <laughs> yeah. And then when they're actually like. You know, she was like, well, you come when you don't, you know, whatever. Yeah, and the queues were going out the door when we got yeah. there, like... They had snacks, which always goes down well with everybody. <laughs> and it was so brilliant, good. because, like, all the people within the market brought out their own snacks. Like, it was very kind of inclusive, and it felt very, like, celebratory of London. And it was real. Yeah, and, and also it was great to see clothes in a, in a context which wasn't just a white room. Mm. And I think that, obviously, um, for most people that don't go to shows, those things are ki kind of irrelevant because they see the pictures and they see the clothes. But actually, when you're a designer and you're putting your, all your effort into making a collection that you want people to feel something about, if you get it in the right setting, it totally makes yeah. it sing in a way that if you're just we'll in a white room, it's kind of how I felt about the sibling show, which was like, oh my God, this is a brand crying out for like a razzy, yeah. Um, location somewhere that kind of you know it, 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 there's so much going on with the clothes but it in a white room it doesn't feel so and I think what? that's what the Martine Rose show kind yeah. of reminds me of which which is that London can be really exciting when it's about and London. it's something that a lot of the international buyers and press commented on 
during that time was that actually they felt like they were just sitting in the same show. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Like it's kind of the same kind of music, the same, probably the same casting, a lot of actually the same boys. Mm. Yeah. And a lot of the same kind of styling ticks. And it, it just all sort of blurred into one. And the designers who managed to break out that are the ones, you know, whether it was through venue like Martin or Cottweiler or whether it was through kind of the production, like people liked what Charles Jeffrey did, which was whether you liked it or disliked it, it was completely unforgettable. Mm. Um, that really kind of unforgettable made, to me because you know there were all those dancers wearing those tights. One of them, his tights split in front of me, and I saw his ball sack. So it was actually <laughs> quite distressing. It was like right in front of me, like mm -hmm. there. Well, that's one way to remember it. But I, it was probably quite intentional given it was Charles <laughs> Jeffrey. It was a really kind of profound moment for me at the London shows. But it felt like kind of 90s fashion shows in a good way. Like I think mm. designers have been really wary of doing theatrical shows because they became such a cliche. But um, then does it overshadow the, can it overshadow the clothes? But yeah. I think there's I such think a return to theatre. If yeah. you look at what's happening with, and like, you know, Rick Owens ever the kind of, you know, ahead of the times with this, doing all of those amazing shows. And then obviously he got bored of that because he's like, I don't want to be known as a showman, but everyone else has followed suit. You know, if you look at, I think Gucci partly, kind of brought that back when they that flip when it was Frida Giannini through to Alessandro McKenna they went from showing in like the Gucci show space mm. to this idea of creating these amazing pieces of theatre I think it's and obviously there's the difficulty that London designers can't compete with that because the budgets that require doing a huge show are so huge but going back to what you guys were saying about Martine that was what was so exciting is like actually you realise that there are these little I know, I know there's always the sort of the worry of ex sort of making your own sort of culture seem exotic or sort oh. of you know playing on a sort of low low culture high culture thing which it, if it didn't feel so or think it's a martina it could have felt a bit like that you know luxury fashion brand shows in a, a market you know it's difficult mm. but i think what she proved is that actually you can there are there are gems within your your own life and your own city particularly when you are a young designer that do you seem really inspiring mm. to other people i um, thought that was totally theatrical in that mm. kind of really down to earth sort of way, but mm. it was quite, it was amazing, like walking through the little alleyway to get into it and being like, what's going on? What is this? Yeah, I think it owed, it definitely felt like it was following in the path of what Vetements had done before, mm. you know, with their sex shop show and their show in the Wait. Chinese restaurant, I think, but, but I think that's completely valid, you know, and obviously she's kind of a part of that world with them. Um, but kind of taking, press in, and the buyers into the, the kind of subculture and the world that you inhabit I think is a really smart thing to do mm. because it, it means that it's more than just some stuff some clothes mm. and the runway which nobody really needs it's it's actually trying to make a point but also this was exactly what you said about fashion direction as well there's a lot of fashion direction in this show yeah. I mean it kind of you know we saw a lot of this wider trouser big old shoulder long coat and all of those things were there and I think that those are, the, those are some of the things as well from London that you kind of want. You want some of that agenda setting. Mm. Mm. And I think this show did that really cleverly. Well, it felt really in keeping with the spirit of the times, as Rob said, because, you know, Rob, you mentioned kind of, you know, she's a part of that whole Vetmon set, because I think people, not that she hasn't got her credit for that, but obviously the role she played was, was more um, behind the scenes, kind of a consultancy role, working on the Balenciaga men's and what have you. So perhaps people aren't aware so much of how she has sort of set that spirit of the times within menswear because she, she is the one that set that agenda, you know, those mm. sort of, that sort of fucked up seating that she does so well and the formality that's what's really interesting. That's one of the things I found really fascinating this season is how suddenly like suits or kind suits of workwear dress. looks cool again, you know, and that's what, what feels the freshest thing and, you know, usually Usually that's something that's just so, like, you, you kind of yawn your way through a suit Well, we spent a hot, we spent about five years talking about what a relief it is that people don't wear ties anymore. And mm. then a lot of the very directional designers showed ties. I, was I mean, I'm still terrified by the idea of it. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking about this with them, because we've got Charlie Porter on our men's panel this afternoon talking about Milan. And he is obsessed with Gianni Versace's Men Without Ties and he always talks about it. But then all these brands are doing ties, they're the brands he loves. So I'm like, will he go against his own taste and start wearing a tie? I'm going to call him out if he does. But it is really interesting, I think, seeing that. Seeing that. And um, why? Why is there such a return to that? Is it because people, is it sportswear on Wii? I think what that's is what it? it is. I mean, I was, I've been trying to figure it out what it is a lot. I think it's partly an ironic thing and a kind of playing with the symbols of corporate culture you know American Psycho cropped up as a reference at about four shows this season mm -hmm. 
which is obviously quite apt given what's going on in the world. Um, but that kind of playing on 80s excess and you know guys in suits and pinstripe and big fat ties and all of that stuff, um, I think part of it's done with a raised eyebrow. But equally, I think for the consumer, when everyone around you is wearing track pants and Yeezy sneakers and a hoodie to the office, it's actually weirdly more subversive now to be wearing a two-piece suit. Mm -hmm. When you say that you, there, you mean the fashion consumer, obviously. But yeah. yeah, what do you think of a sort of a wider... I wonder if it's also makes sense of a wider consumer as well, because this is actually what a lot of them do wear, you know, you still... Well, I think it's not actually. I think if you're on the tube or, or you're walking around, you don't see guys in tailoring anymore. Everybody, no. everybody is wearing denim and sweatpants. So that's why this suddenly feels kind of bracing again. Um, and, where, uh, you know, I think it took a really long time for the, for the guy on the street to catch up with the fact that he doesn't have to wear a suit anymore. So now it's flipping again. So maybe, mm. you know, who knows whether he'll, he'll want to go back into tailoring. And what's interesting is this is not a workwear proposition. Often when you see suits at London Collections, when it is kind of, a, you know, for the working man, and this is not, you know, this is not a mm. proposition for you to wear to the office. This is like, you know, your fashion look is your, is your suit. It's interesting you mentioned that 80s thing, because I do think there is this kind of, you, meant, you said the word excess, I think, and I think that's really interesting, because another theme of this season for me was sort of logos and slogans, and like a return to logo mania is super interesting if you think about what that says about consumption and kind of conspicuous consumption and truly the end of sort of stealth wealth by us going back to that, and I wonder if this is all a part of it. What, what's your take on it all, Simon, why that wheel has turned in this direction? Well, in terms of this Martine type stuff yeah, or the workwear kind of thing? Across, across the board, there's kind of those like retro references that Rob kind of mentions, the turning of the clock back. Well, I, do, I mean, I do think that, there, that on a very simplistic note, it is due to the fact that we've reached peak sportswear and you have to, it has to go somewhere else. And I think the styling stuff with the tie immediately makes people go, oh, look, that's a thing. We haven't seen that for a while. Mm. And then it kind of takes a bit of time to kind of permeate and, um, and we'll see what happens. I mean, you know, Balenciaga talked about, when the, about their men's collection. It was all inspired by boardrooms and office workers. And, uh, you know, and we, we know that this season has been, a lot of people have been talking about normal, mm -hmm. like normal stuff. And, you know, some of it is because, I guess, designers are looking at what's going on in the global world and the political world and are looking to find things that are kind of anchored in some sort of reality mm. because a lot of what's going on at the moment is quite terrifying. And so I guess a reality that you can, as Rob says, sort of play with, yeah. which is that boardroom thing. It's like you can make a political statement through that. Mm. But equally, going back to what you were saying about logos, I mean, you know, like Christopher Shannon, there was a lot of those kinds of like in that collection about sort of saying, what we doing, like mm. what's happening. What did and we make of the Christopher Shannon show? Because I thought that was a really, really interesting one. It's interesting what we're talking about with designers going back to their roots and you know doing stuff that really relate to their world. And this was all, he, um, this was all quite North inspired as well. He had that amazing soundtrack um, of all the different places in the North, which appealed to me because he just contributed work to my North exhibition, which is very exciting. Um, but what did we, a lot of people seem to think that this was a real strong collection. I thought film. it was a total return to form. I thought it was. <laughs> you would say I thought it was a total disaster. <laughs> I was like, whoa. <laughs> Awful. I'm going to get that controversial. No, I thought, it was, I thought it was the best it's been from him in a long time. Um, he kind of just did what you want him to do, which is a bit of humour, but quite a deadpan humour. Yeah. Some really nice workwear shapes and some sportswear. Like, that's kind of all you really want from Shannon. Mm. I also loved that. It, it had that sort of ski vibe to it, some of the quilting and the sort of padded trousers, mm. which is a different direct, a different way of looking into the whole yeah. sportswear thing, which was quite... I also different. think it's interesting that he's doing, you know, I loved last season when he did all of the sort of layered denim because, you know, I think we were talking about this sort of um, at the Calvin Klein show, a few journalists, is how jeans have sort of been the awkward thing that fashion's never got right. You know, just no one's ever, since like Helmut Lang, you've never seen a good fashion brand that's really done like a killer pair of jeans. And that's kind of maybe part of the reason that Vetmon seems so exciting. Obviously Calvin Klein are playing with that. And I think what's nice about Shannon is also just like a really, really, like really, really interesting ways of playing with denim for men. You know, Marcus Almeida got it right for women, but, but it is, if jeans have always sort of existed outside of fashion. You know, if you look at mm. the shows, it, all the people who are attending, they're wearing vintage Levi's, and no one's wearing like a fashion jean, and that's quite interesting in that context. I mean, I'm not sure about those ripped pair. I, I don't know if I'd like to see any of you guys in those, but <laughs> maybe not. But I think he was talking after the show about the fact that he'd been inspired by the people that he sees on his everyday 
in his everyday world, mm. careers and builders, van drivers and builders. And I think that that is a really interesting narrative for this whole season. Mm. That designers are like, what is normal? What is real? What but then, is there an irony to them making clothes and selling them at that much money when it's all about? Yeah, of yeah. course. Because it's weird, isn't it? It's across. I, I kind of take less of an issue with it when it's a younger brand that does it because, you know. You, behind all the smokers and mirrors of the fashion industry, you know that these young London designers you know, are not living a life of luxury and are probably mm. not making very much money at all. So it kind of somehow seems slightly less problematic to me, even though the final cost of their clothing is quite extortionate for them to be referencing those things. But this obsession with sort of being boring, I don't, I find it somehow quite problematic sometimes. I think it depends on, on the intention and whether the intention comes, because when it's fetishizing kind of the working class, obviously that's a problem and it can veer into that sometimes um, you know we, we went through a phase of a lot of designers sort of referencing sort of scally culture mm. and chav and all that kind of stuff which i think was was quite difficult to reconcile but i think when it's with someone like shannon it comes from actually that's his background like he's he is interested in these cultures and these subcultures um, so it's real and it's honest and he's and he's just referencing what he grew up around and what he what he's mm. seen. It's not a seasonal thing as well, it's his, that's yeah. his brand. It's his yeah. brand, yeah. Because there is that thing of like when you reference something you then also perpetrate the stereotypes, like, which is kind of that Vetmon show, not to veer too of course from London Collection, Room, but when they did the stereotype show mm. it was like, but how can you break a stereotype if you're acknowledging it? And so it all became very sort of musty what the point of that show was. Mm. Um, and yeah, I think it's interesting, like that poverty porn aspect of menswear at the moment, which I think came along slightly with all the sportswear stuff, where it felt very easy for designers to sort of reference these cultures that they probably never touched, and it can feel quite uncomfortable. Mm. But I don't think that I think that's something that Shannon kind of manages to break through quite well. What else was inspiring and interesting to us? I loved Kottweiler. Kottweiler. Mm. Cool. Oh, it was really good. Yeah, it was really, really good. And what, what that's Jada Branson, here we go, quite better. What makes those boys so interesting? Like, there is an interesting thing to them of like, um, I think for, for a long time, there was no real references to, like overt references to sort of gay culture within men's fashion. And they've done this very interesting thing of sort of making these little nods to sort of fetish to, and it kind of, they came along at the same time as like Pizza that did that as well, which was really interesting. And I think, Whenever you saw something that was sort of, you know, informed by a gay male, it was often quite camp and he got in the kind of D squared territory. And I think what these guys have done is really look at sort of, you know, the world of a gay man and, 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 and taken really interesting references from that. And I, I wonder if that's part of the appeal. I don't know. It's, what do you <coughs> make of it, Rob? I think, again, it, they're, they're looking around them. Like, I, I think they're not doing a kind of idealised, imagined version of, like, hunky, Dolce, you know, tan, tan speedos, whatever. Like that, that's not that's not what they're trying to talk about because that's not what they they know. They're looking at the men that they they're looking at each other. They're looking at the men around them, looking at what they grew up around, and they're looking at you know what they grew up around was rave culture, and they have this prolonged interest in fetish and gay subculture, and this kind of quite grubby underbelly of of London gay nightlife. And actually, that's a really fascinating kind of pool of references, which no one's ever really touched before. Mm. And that's why, you know, even if you don't know any of those references, I think that's what makes it a really interesting brand. Is if you know the story of it, then yeah, it's fascinating. But equally, you could be, you know, Joe Bloggs, really looking on a, a website, go past that bomber jacket and think, oh, that's a cool jacket, I'll have it. Mm. You know, because there's enough consideration into the design, regardless of whether you understand the references. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's a hidden meaning, the kind of hidden... Yeah. I also feel like this is, you know, the the whole sportswear thing that we've already talked about. I think it, they still do it in an interesting way that still makes this something that feels different and yeah, I it's was... not too like, you know, of a type. It's very, it's theirs. It doesn't feel like if you wore it, you'd be sort of buying into the sportswear trend. I think that's a problem with a lot of those brands that really do sportswear stuff. Is as soon as you engage with it, you become someone who wants to buy branded sort of designer sportswear whereas I think if you're wearing Cottweiler it kind of it's got that um I'm like always really interested with how designers create like a veneer of intellectualism around them you know like like Prada does it best or 
Ray Kawakubo, J.D. Anderson has very successfully managed to do it. I was talking about this yesterday, so it sounded like a broken record. But like, when you go to their shows and you presume there is a, like, a higher meaning, and if you don't like the show, you're like, oh, I'm a moron, I didn't understand mm. it. And I think Cotwider as a very young brand have very, very quickly started to do that. Whereas when you're at their shows, you're like, it goes back to references Rob was talking about because you're aware of how layered their inspirations are. You presume that there is something more intellectual, more meaty behind it. So it kind of takes it out of that world of kind of branded designer sportswear. Well, it's wear. interesting that they never, they said to me that they never, they will never do anything with a logo on it. Mm. Because they, they grew up around you know, everybody just wanting that sweatshirt because it was Nike or Stone Island or whatever it is. And actually they want you to be able to recognise a piece of crop while by the design elements mm. of it, not by the, the name on it. Um, and I think that's that's a really smart approach for them to take. Like they don't, the, it's not just about the kind of obvious. You know, even when you're looking at these pictures from the catwalk, a lot of London designers, especially some of the ones who've sadly closed, I think, and I think it's part of the reason why they've closed, is that you'd have had these two looks, and then a guy would have come out in a logo T-shirt and a pair of sweatpants as the kind of easy retail look mm. for the buyers to latch onto. And they don't do that. And I think those brands that we we think are cleverer. Are, are good at that. Like they don't give you an easy kind of oh here's a tick boxing. Yeah. Look. They don't just dilute it. Yeah, exactly. It's completely undiluted. It's it, and that's what JW also always does. Is actually it can be a nightmare for a retailer because you're looking mm. through the pictures thinking where's the picture we can kind of sell to the customer um, because every look is quite tricky. Mm. But actually, it also means that there's a completely considered statement from the brand from the beginning to the end of the show. What did we make of the JW show? Um, I'm still trying to work it out. Um, but that's what I mean, he does that. Where yeah. like, if you don't immediately like yeah, it, you're yeah, like, yeah. let me muse on this. For <laughs> I loved the one before yeah. um, a lot. <clears throat> and I, there are elements of this when I saw it in the showroom in Paris that I liked. But as a show, I didn't, it didn't make me, I you always usually feel a bit hysterical yeah. after, um, well, particularly the last one. But this one, I don't know, I think it was just like, uh, there's a lot going on. And there was a lot of layers, and and I, I don't know, like I, it didn't it didn't move me in the same way that I've felt before. Mm. But it kind of when you look back on it, it ticked a lot of it ticks a lot of trends, like mm. big trousers, long coats, big knitwear, painted denim, etc., etc., etc. So I don't know. It felt a bit to me like a bit of a stopgap yeah. collection in a way. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I just well, think, I think it didn't difficult time for him in some way because for so long he was like the avant-garde voice and now obviously there's like Demner and all of that crowd so it's like where he where does he sit now is he somehow less cool less edgy and I mean I think that if you I mean I think he is one of the designers that in London you always want if we didn't have JW Anderson in London it would be it would be, huge be loss, quite yeah. flat yeah I mean, you know like this is always a moment where so the expectations on all yeah. of his collections are Huge yeah. because and he you, the yeah, season and, with Lueva and actually well. because it's like a fashion show. It's like yeah. you know sometimes, and it goes back to that thing of like you know sitting in a white room. Da, 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 you always feel like you're at a show. show. It's always and been he was really, really well smart thought through early in LCM to be one of the first to go. I'm not going to show as part of the BFC space. I'm not yeah. going to do that anonymous yeah. white box. You know, I'm sure it's wildly expensive for him to rent that space and build that. But set it totally works. works. Yeah, and it means that you remember the show because mm. you remember how you felt. You know the. the the seating is very claustrophobic. You're sat about a foot away from the people opposite you. Mm. You can practically feel the models going past yeah. you as they walk. Mm. And it's it never translates to the pictures how intense it no, is. No, it's when really intense. There. And it's the music really, is, you yeah. know, it's always an incredible score. Like it, at it, nine a.m. as well. And it's at nine a.m. Yeah, so everybody has. Yeah. To, it's a bit like going to church. Like <laughs> everybody, you know, it's it's a memorable experience. I thought that one of the reasons I was talking to Charlie Porter about this. One of the reasons why this one didn't tick as many boxes for me. Is because he was one of the only ones in London that didn't really engage with what's happening in the wider world. Oh, but I got a bit okay. I'm going to go on a rant here, and then we'll, we'll go there talking. You think. I got a bit tired of that with the London. Well, not actually with the London shows. I think it was most believable in London with the season in general. Like a lot of the, a lot of the London designers made these kind of quite interesting, quite Brexit-specific points mm. about how tricky their life was going to be, and it was all a bit dystopian. And like it kind of London designers have always kind of been able to do that slightly, like oh, fuck you, we're so angry thing because most London designers, as I said earlier, kind of don't have that much money of working out tiny tiny studios what have you but I just think as a season no one made a bold political statement like absolutely no one came out and said anything that really sort of put like that wasn't safe enough to not scare off any briars and press so I got a bit annoyed when everyone was like 
fashion being so political. It's like, political what? Like, not really. Like, they still had loads of white models and operated very conventional ways. So I get what you're saying, but I think if he'd have, what, done... Because all he would have needed to do to take that box was, like, do, like, a little kind of, like, broken American flag on, like, a cuff, and we would have been like, oh, Jonathan, like, stay political. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's like, the bar is pretty low for doing something. Yeah, but I think you can also really over... You hit that nail on the head and sort of, you know, there were a few... Um, shows over the season that felt like really like okay we get it like we want some news like good for you mm -hmm. and actually you know the, the more nuanced takes on the fact that just on the fact that you know the kind of anxiety and kind of feeling of fear that's kind of in the air amongst you know young creative people yeah. in you know in the western world at the moment is a weird thing not to kind of weave in you know i thought craig green was really good yeah that's at doing that actually you know it was a really beautiful collection and and if you if you're not really interested in anything else and you just look at the clothes, they're very nice clothes. But actually, there was also a bit of a kind of feeling of ominousness and dread mm. and sort of, and there was a darkness to what he's done, which he hasn't done, really done before. No. I think there was, sorry to go back to JW, but <laughs> in, a, in a sense, that what I took from the kind of the long, cosy layers and the childlike crochet, like granny crochet, was that kind of like protection, like mm. looking after yourself sort of vibe, which in the same way it was in Quay, it was kind of like you're armoring yourself from mm. something and this was like a soft that's what i took from some of the but i think jonathan anderson has always done this kind of willful sort of naivety mm. like i th think that particularly with Loewe, i think the collection it, it's often like childlike motifs you know and even when he doesn't do something that feels super sort of touched by hand and crafty like when he did all the robot stuff it was still very childlike because it was like robots and I think that's kind of almost one of his signatures is that sort of odd boyishness where it looks a little bit and he can make that quite fetishistic sometimes like when he did like ages ago when he did like the ruffles and the sort of bloomers that looked a bit like you know when when children when men are young enough to wear women's clothes basically when mm. kids dress like each other and I think he always kind of plays like like with that and the craftiness that's um, sort of what I miss though is a bit of provocation from him yeah like, it, that was a, such a, like, everybody came out of that ruffle to was an opinion on it. You either thought it was genius or you thought it was total bullshit. Hideous, yeah. Whereas uh, this one, I, I think Bit everyone fat. came out going, yeah, yeah, But then, yeah. do you know, the ruffles was, what, spring, summer, 13? And I think that's also, well, that's a long time ago now. This is autumn, winter, 17. I think it is also hard because his big sort of, like, Trump card, not Trump, Trump, like, as in Trump card, <laughs> was, um was like gender bending and now everyone does it everyone does it and mm. i don't want to i think in some ways he did set that off and is probably mm. a little bit peeved that like you know those people such as alexander michele get all the credit for that but then it's like i think if he went back to that a bit now maybe he should actually because if he went back to it maybe it would jog those memories as like how he was a little bit of an author of that but but there, I mean, there's still there's still little like nod, nods and winks to that in in this collection of, in, and i don't you know it's not like He's sending out lads down the room. Like, you know, it still has a kind of girly it's boy thing going on, yeah. which is which is good because he does that really well. And there was a lot of layers in this to one pick, and I think that, you know, sometimes it just takes a bit longer to figure stuff out. Figure stuff out. I definitely think it was still a good show. His shows aren't I wonder if it, they're never sexy at all, they're never sensual at all. His early shows used to be, I think mm. they were quite fetishy. Whereas now his shows, I think, are super, and I don't even mean it. I don't mean it as a criticism. I can't work out what I think about it, but they're so asexual. They're quite chilly in a way. You know, they're, they're not. Despite all the layering and the colours and the tones, like you should. There's something about this that should feel really warm and crafty, but it never. There's always this like, I don't know. And it, for this one, I thought it was interesting because you know he's. Like, I've been thinking a lot of, at the moment about this idea of, like, the designer as curator, because obviously, like, I don't know if you guys saw the show notes for Raph's first thing at Calvin Klein, it talked about, like, his curatorial approach to the brand. I was like, hmm, interesting. And that's obviously what Jonathan Anderson has done. He's always made a point that he's, like, a creative director, not a designer, and he's actually now physically curating this show at the, at the Whitworth, like, Disobedient Bodies, which is opening, I think, in it's about a month now, yeah. So, obviously, that would have <coughs> played a part in him putting together this collection, and... I do you think you're starting to be able to tell a difference between those designers who actually design clothes and those designers who work with references and inspirations? And I think it's partly because of the quantity of shows that they're having to produce, but like this does look like like it is about tipping his cap and nodding his head to all these different references rather than about garments and cuts and clothes. And mm. But then that look there, bomber jacket and jeans, you 
see, like you say, you can, it's painted jeans, but you see that on the tube. Mm -hmm. It's super wearable, which is quite unlike. I think, yeah, there's obviously going to be, I don't know how, I think he's never one that smashed it with the sales figures, I get the impression that, I don't know, does it do well for you at Matches? I mean, it's, it's, um, it's a young brand. I mean, yeah. it, it takes time it takes to build time. it up and it's working. I think it's a bit um, like Raph in that sense, where it's, yeah, like, it's never sure. been a huge commercial but, but, I, but I think that what, what he has done over the past few, few seasons is create <coughs> collections which have got lots of things in them mm. that are starting to become very much his Stuff, references. Yeah. And some, some of them are actually quite simple pieces. Like one of the things that has sold really well is the t-shirt the with the knotted sleeve. It's a really yeah. simple thing. It's very him, yeah. um, but not necessarily like a catwalky thing. But that's, you know, those kinds of things have worked quite well. Yeah, that's interesting, the little signatures. I'm quite just of time. Who else did we think was super interesting and fantastic? We kind of briefly talked about Craig. Um, who else got us excited? I thought Charles, I mean, we sort of touched on it, but I thought Charles Jeffrey was, was really not necessarily my, a show that I personally love. Very you, the look on the right. <laughs> <laughs> but I did think it was a show that was <clears throat> interesting. Yes. You know, I thought he, I think he's, he's sort of starting to be clearly become the next big London name. Well, it's interesting what you all say about tailoring, feeling current again, and his kind of whole shtick is like rewriting. Well, he's tailoring. really good at it. I mean, it looks really, it's, it looks really good on the runway, and like a lot of the criticism in the past about young designers has been the finish or the make of the yeah. clothes has been a bit a cut, rubbish. Cut a mm. But you can see it. I mean, it looks really, it's beautifully tailored. Mm. Right? It's very well put together. I did miss though when it used to be. I mean, his his one his show two seasons ago, the one that was kind of a bit of a Vivian Westwood homage, the sort of punky one. Mm. was so joyous and, and fun and up and the, his very first person he's supposed to take yeah. when he did the club night in yeah. Yeah. Oh, ICA yeah. was again like it you know it was kind of mad but it was also really energizing and the last two have been very sort of door and quite but that's what I mean with this gentleman dark. and the bandwagon thing don't you think young designers feel like they have to be they have to do something that's kind of like a oh, woe is me to feel like they're sort of I, it just doesn't I, I I think it's like become like the new kind of smart thing to do is to like do something that's really dystopian and I, in a way I get it because it's like it would feel kind of like a bit of a clangor to do something super like isn't life wonderful like right And now. that's why I think Milan felt like such a weird and off season because you know it was so Marie Antoinette you know like those shows that were so like ah, everything's fun, let's do Lame and let's do loads of like, like jazzy colours and everyone's gonna clap and like it was so it was so off key, like, yeah. and it was like, like where, where's your head? So I think it's a really hard line to tell. I agree that I think, you know, the endless kind of misery, it feels a bit like at the end of the day, you're trying to kind of get aspiration young people and essentially yeah. get them to buy into your product. Mm. Um, and you don't, nobody wants to buy something that feels miserable. So it would be quite nice to see designers kind of, maybe a little bit more escapism would be quite. I think escapism is a really good word that's something that designers in London There was an do. element, I mean, there's kind of an element of escapism in yeah. this. I mean, you know, there were people like in body stockings swinging themselves around. Yeah, but they were really I mean, aggressive, pretty, yeah. terrifying. Yeah, no, I know, but like, it, escapism doesn't have to just be jolly. It can no. just be quite transported somewhere else. But then I remember something which the late, great Joe Bates said to me from Sibling when he did an interview here as part of our own fashion series where he said it doesn't have to be bleak to be deep. And no, I thought that was one of the true. smartest things a lot of people have said. Because that is the thing in, in London fashion sometimes is it can get a little bit. And I think that's maybe why everyone's caught on to Rotting Dean Bazaar. I think we have got, it was part of the um, fashion -y stuff, it'll be quite hard to see because it's like they do installations and stuff. But why everyone's caught on to the Rotting Dean Bazaar thing because it, it's kind of, it's funny. And well, it was so silly. <coughs> yeah. You kind of, it's kind of nice or something that you could just kind of laugh at. Yeah. And this isn't it. It's like the instant Brit can find it. Um, yeah. Sorry, Rob, I cut you off. It was, you know, like, it was, you know, there was nothing to say about it except that it was completely absurd. I mean, you can see the pictures, like it was, you know, it was, it was. This is it. Completely daft. But actually, isn't that kind of great? Like, yeah. you know, I think it's I think it's interesting that you talked about sibling because they they're one of the brands who's always done that. Like, no matter what's going on in the world, no matter what everybody else is doing, they've always towed their own line and always done something mm. that's really up and fun. And actually, God love them for it because mm. actually, you go through so many shows of kind of plodding, thumpy electro music and models, you know, 
serious fringes, sort of looking like they want to cry. And then, like, actually, why not just have a laugh like it's only clothes? Mm -hmm. And so I think this is, that's a really interesting thing about them, you know. It's, I think it's a, a way of being uh, ready for a retailer, but at least it's something to make you smile. But I don't, that, it's interesting they're kind of presenting themselves almost like it's like installations mm -hmm. and projects. I kind of wonder what will happen with all of this, and I wonder whether there are going to be a set of designers that are coming out at the moment who take that kind of Victor and Rolf type model of like showing in galleries and operating almost as like a sort of art studio rather than... I mean, I think that there's so many fashion brands now and fashion has become such a business in a way that it wasn't 10 years ago that these up-and-coming brands are thinking of new ways of doing things and it goes right back to the very beginning what Graham was saying about brands finding ways of doing what they want to do and how they want to do yeah. it. And, you know, there is no, like, you know, if they're, if they're not... If their sole goal is not to be stocked in a store and they, and they want it to be more about a creative process, then that's that's brilliant and they should do that and then if that develops and evolves into being something else that's more commercial later on then that's also great but like you know we've seen lots of designers in, that have come from London that start in that way that you know they are very creative and then it becomes a more commercial well, position. Well a really interesting one for that like yeah. I think the way what Grace Wells Bonnet started and she so did start it on her own terms mm. and is still really doing it on her own terms you know she invites about three people to her show <laughs> You know, and and she just she, just, she lets you into her world if she chooses to let you into it, um, and I think she, you know actually I think it's kind of a shame that it's taken to the runway now. I thought it was it was a much more interesting proposition in the way she used to present it. Yeah. You know, and you've got a much stronger you know looking at these pictures, you don't really get a sense of of her of what her mm. references and her world is. Well, There's as soon as it's on a runway, regardless of what the clothes look like, like it looks like everything else in a sense because yeah. that visual is so sort of ubiquitous of like a man striding towards the camera. Yeah. This one was interesting as well because the people that actually went to the show came away from it with a real sense of that the show had informed their opinion of the collection. Yeah, the show. And I feel like if you didn't go to the show, then you sort of didn't quite get it. Yeah, it was interesting. Basically, they had this big like speaker system in the middle and then it was quite amazing in terms of the soundtrack, like Samfer had done a part of it. And they came, they went round in a circle around it and the guys in white walked really slowly and the guys wearing stuff and the girls in white and the people who weren't wearing white walked really fast. Like to the point where it was actually really annoying, you couldn't see the clothes at all. Mm. But then they kind of would slow down at certain points. It was, it was quite amazing and it was, it was very much that kind of choreographed sort of... And also it was interesting the fact they went in a circle and they were kind of lapping and crossing each other because it looked... Often, I think she's often presenting her clothes in a way where they feel quite rarefied, whereas this, it looked like, you know, the street, like it looked like people walking and, you know, you, you know when you're on she a She was talking a lot about street style and yeah. mashing that with Renaissance, I think. Mm. But it, I think that was an interesting thing because of the, that is the problem slightly with her clothes, partly because they're so expensive, is you're kind of like, oh, but you, where is the life of this garment going to sort of exist? And I think that proposition of like actually and they did look great they looked kind of she made them look more normal in a way which was maybe a well it looked more commercial do. in the showroom yeah. there were definitely more things on the rail that you could imagine the outerwear more really people mm. Mm. actually wearing and what do i think it's interesting like it's interesting i think the way that she keeps her keeps her show small and stuff i think the tricky thing for her will be keeping that sort of I don't know, she's, when you're that young of a designer and you're sort of swinging your weight around that much, in the, in, not as a person, but in the sense of like, you know, the fact that she is a hot thing and like can turn people away from her show and stuff, you know, most young designers do not have that luxury. It's interesting just how that buzz is going to be maintained and kept and I think that'll be interesting to see. Well, I think it keeps people sort of lapping at her brand. Like, as you said before, you get so many designers who, who are letting anybody in and, any, and it's part, everybody can come and have it and you know we'll take whatever venue we can get and we'll do it however, however we can do it and it just doesn't feel very considered whereas what she does is this is what I'm doing this is what it looks like this is where it's going to be and you can be part of it or you can not be part of it and that approach is what, to me what feels the most modern now and what kind of links all of those brands that we've talked about that we like like Martine and Kotweiler and her and Craig and everyone is that they're not, it's not for everyone. And mm. they're not trying to do all things to all people. They're just doing, this is who, this is what I am, and this is what I do. That is definitely, without question, why this London was good, was because all those brands that, that had a really good season were brands that just did what they do. 
mm. and moved it on. You know, like I think to go back to Coral, what's really interesting about them is that they haven't rushed. They have kind of have let that mm. brand evolve in a really good way. And like when they did that Reebok thing in Pity, it just was so believable that collaboration in a way because I think they had this. I mean, this, I love this collection and I love the show. And it was again another one which was out of the sort of white room thing. It was kind mm. of a, it felt like a thing, like an experience. Mm. And there were loads of also there was just really loads of good clothes in it. I think that's also going back to what you're saying when brands do their own thing. That's why you then want to buy into it because people often sort of think about like buying something because you want to sort of support a young designer. But it's difficult to do that when they're making stuff that looks kind of like everything else because then you're like, well, why would I buy that when I could buy, you know, a Prada version where I equally align myself with the ideal of Michel Prado? It's probably going to be better made. And but there, there is something about these brands when you really get what you're buying into, you don't feel like you're just pointlessly buying something from a young designer. You're buying something that is part of the mentality. I think that's why a lot of people have bought Crave or what have you. Or, Grace Wells Bonner particularly <coughs> is that sense of getting something that you you actually just could not get somewhere else like maybe you could get something that looked like the garment somewhere else but you couldn't get all of that that behind story to yeah. it which I think there are other brands that just don't have that it's like you could buy their tracksuit bottoms or their whatever but you don't feel like there's much that comes with it whereas it's that old school thing of buying something and being part of a club isn't it which is maybe that's the only way that these kind of brands can survive when they're on their way up I think it's a, it's equally though with so like a Martin Rose Barmer jacket or a Craig Green sort of you know uniform jacket. They are really amazing. You know, I have those yeah. pieces in my wardrobe and I wear them every day because they're really great. So it's it, it's still just great clothes. Great as well. stuff. Like yeah. it's really well tailored or it's really amazing fabric. That's the thing with Cop Valley. The fabrics are always incredible. Yeah. And but they're also keeping what they do really small, like on a business level. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Craig has turned away an awful lot of stockists. You know, has done from the very beginning has only worked with partners who he believes will, will do will share his vision and you know grace is extremely protective about her brand about how yeah. you shoot it who it's shot on um cotweiler are the same you know they don't they won't just work with anyone mm -hmm. uh, and i think that's something that's actually really changed in the last couple of years is that kind of i think the generation before maybe of young designers were actually really pressured by external bodies that you, or you need to get everybody in, you need to sell internationally, you have to sell in America, you have mm. to launch a women's work, you need to be doing pre. And actually what, what we saw sadly is that most of those labels have now closed because they were just spreading themselves way too way thin. Too thin yeah. And it was the same actually for that generation of American designers that they all were given exactly Well, the they were trying pressure. to compete on this scale, yeah, that it's just impossible. Yeah, they just to get up there and yeah. be Prada and actually, yeah. of course that's never gonna happen. Whereas I think this, this group has really managed to reject that really smartly and, and very bravely because you know there's no guarantee you know if you have a very small business you lose one stockist and you'll fall up mm. that's but what i love about totally paid off for them yeah mm. what i love about craig's um he gives different things to different stockists as well so yeah. it's not you can't buy the same jacket everywhere you buy them in a certain colorway as selfridges you buy them in a mm. certain colorway it matches and mm. that's very smart because mm. it's not everywhere yeah I think. well it still feels considered <laughs> doesn't it i think that's the thing I'm conscious there's so many people we've missed, but I'm also conscious of time. So like, I think we've, you wrapped up quite well, Simon, when you said like, it feels like people doing their, sort of going back to their roots and doing what they're best at. But what's our sort of big takeaway for the London shows? Do we want to, I, I get the sense we all want to see London Collections Men keep going, but we're sort of aware of the inevitable plot of the women's wear shows, snatching our men's wear and taking them in with them. What's I think they just, I think what needs to happen is we need to, to the designers that are that it's working really well with just need to keep doing what they're doing and other designers need to kind of try and find ways to show in more interesting spaces and that's something that I think the BFC needs to support more um, and then I think it needs a little bit of a trim but like not by much I just think the schedule needs a little tight bit a bit of tightening up but there's lots of really good things here and you know when you are when you're traveling and you're talking to people from other countries they want to come here mm. they want to see what's going on here because no one they're, they're, you don't see these types of designers in other countries no um so you know it would be deeply sad if we didn't have and i really don't want it to end me like well, you know why would we go back to even bolted mm. on the end of women's wear it was, well, it was it really was interesting like, also this season because there was that fashionista thing that selfridges did and there was like so everyone was kind of thinking about old fashionista and I was thinking about like 
the amazing people that have come through London, like, you know, people that are still showing there, but also, you know, your Kim Joneses or your Goshers, you know, people mm -hmm. that have been supported by, by London. And, and you, you do think that's really important, you know, it's super, and Jenny Lee Anderson himself, like all through Fashion East, through Man and what have you. And, and there's still new people like Rotten Dean or like yeah. Kika, who's yeah. doing it's his amazing. own thing, yeah. but it's incredible. And, you know, two or, two or three seasons in just out of school. I think yeah, that's what's great. Doing London still has that newness, which, yeah. if, which I think all London men's wear still has that newness. So if you lost LCM, you'd kind of take a step back with that. Yeah, and I do think, you know, it's not controversial to say more of the newness is coming out in the men's than it is the women's at the moment totally. in London. Like, and we need more of that. Let's have more of that. Like, mm. put more newness on the schedule. Mm. I just think that would be, you know, that's another reason why people will come. Well, that's why they come here mm. to see that. So more of that is what we need. More, more, more. Should we give them all a round of applause for giving us so much to talk about? <laughs> 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 I'm <in touch> <laughs>